from a microbiome point of view, it is undeniable that is not a good idea. You are likely increasing your risk of eventually developing gut problems. So I've been studying gut microbiota for well over 20 years now, and the only thing I do differently, the only thing I take that is different to before I started is... The importance of the gut microbiome to our overall health is now a huge area of scientific exploration, with research increasingly showing it plays a major role. The Rowett Institute in Aberdeen is one of the UK's leading research centres in this area. In fact, it was one of the research centres to first establish the link between poor diet and ill health. Today, it continues to work on overcoming major diet-related health problems, along with developing the next generation of pre- and probiotics for improved gut health. So, is there a one-size-fits-all solution to gut health? And what do we know for sure about how best to support it? Well, today you'll hear from Senior Research Fellow at the Rowett Institute, Microbiologist Professor Alan Walker, as he explains why the unique composition of our microbiomes has big implications for the development of effective treatments and supplements. And with so many claims about what different bacteria can do for our gut and all the things we should be consuming to improve it, Professor Walker will set out for us today what has actually been concretely established by science and what we've yet to discover about our gut microbiome and the things that impact it. Professor Walker, welcome to the channel. Great, thanks for having me, Claire. Pleasure to be here. Well, you're most welcome. And I thought a great place to start because you have such an interesting job would be to find out what your work at the Rowett Institute involves and your particular focus when it comes to the gut microbiome. Sure. Yep. Yeah. So um, the Rowett Institute is a nutrition um, institute. So uh, most of my interests um, working there are really in understanding links between what we eat in our diets um, and how that impacts on health via impacts on the microbiota. So obviously what we eat doesn't just impact us, it impacts the microbes that live in our gut. And so really my job is really to try and disentangle that really complex relationship whereby, you know, if we eat something, how does that impact the, mug, the bugs? And then in turn, how does that impact us as hosts? So to that end, I'm interested in, in lots of different features, very busy and um, varied career, but we're interested in protecting uh, the body against uh, invading pathogens and reducing infectious disease by using the power of a microbiota. We, as I say, are interested in, you know, um, what microbes will break down particular dietary ingredients. You know, if you eat fibre, how is that going to change your microbes? Um, interested in how they function, which microbes out of all the thousands of different bacteria that live in our gut are likely to be most important for health. So it's so quite a varied uh, bag of stuff that we do, but um, all with that sort of general unifying theme of trying to work out which members of the microbiota are functionally important for us as hosts. Well, this is what makes you exactly the person we want to hear from. So much to dig into there. And I'm just going to go right ahead and start with a, a huge sweeping question, which is, mm. you know, what do you think most people don't understand about the gut microbiome that you really wish they did? My thing <laughs> I'm quite often asked to comment on is on overhype and, and you know, myths that surround the microbiota and, and things that, you know, really have become common knowledge without actually being true. And so what, what I try and do when I do these sort of, you know, public facing chats is try and capture the balance between the real um, promise and hope that we will develop therapies from our microbiota that are going to help cure a whole range of different ailments with the reality of where we are at the moment of what we can be delivering. And I think for me, that's the thing I, I really try and get across to the public is that this area has huge promise, but actually what's available right now to treat is, is actually limited um, in evidence. And, you know, I think we, we have a, some way to go as scientists and as a field to, to develop products that really do work and really will have that benefit. And so for me, I, I really wish that it was... Um, a little more nuanced, the communication about the microbiome. You can go online and see all sorts of things that tell you this bug does this, this does this. And actually, when you really delve into it, the evidence really often isn't quite there. So so I guess the thing I wish that was more apparent to the public is that it's really complicated. Um, you know, lots of good things are coming, but actually, you know, 
we really have to really um, you know be evidence based and really think really investigate you know what really is something that's closer and we can use now and something that actually you know is not maybe got the level of evidence we would like so i guess it's complicated and you know it's not easy the microbiome is a very difficult thing to work with there are thousands of species in there every single person has a different collection of those meaning what's in your gut is different from my gut meaning you know when we try and intervene and alter those you and I can have very different responses because what's in our gut is different to start with. So that's the that, that's the, the, the thing I really wish that would be wider spread is that it's really difficult and very rarely simple sound bites are accurate in all cases. That, that usually is not the case. Yeah. And, you know, this comes across over and over again when I'm interviewing scientists and doctors and so on, on the channel. Uh, I mean, I spoke to a skin microbiome specialist not so long ago and um, who said a very similar thing, that we're really just scratching the surface and the interconnection mm. yeah. between the skin and the brain and the gut and so on. You know, there's just so much to learn. And as you say, you know, you can pick up a pill from somewhere that promises to mm. uh, repopulate your gut with all the best bacteria. We can come on to that. We just, yeah, we yeah. just don't know what that is yeah, right I'm now. So that's a great starting point. Yeah. 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 Um, what do you think most people should know as a starting point about diet and the gut microbiome mm. that they may not know right now? Again, it, it relates to that nuance that I talked about and, and, and that difference between everyone's microbiome. You know, everyone has a unique collection of microbes that's just theirs. <clears throat> I will say think of it as your own very smelly fingerprint, right? It's unique to you. And so because everyone has a different collection of microbes, what that means is that you know when we have a dietary intervention, you and I eat something, you and I can eat identical diets, but can have a very different response because fundamentally those diets are interacting with different groups of microbes in our guts. And so what that can mean is, you know, that if, if I eat starch, say, for example, and you eat starch, you should not always assume that just because starch give you a good response, it should happen for me too, because fundamentally that starch is interacting with different microbes. So the response is different. Wow, that opens up a huge can of worms, really, because that kind of means, A, we, we don't know right now how we're responding as individuals, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it means, it sounds like there's no one blanket diet that is going to best suit our gut microbiome because we just can't tell that at the moment. I think that's probably true, yeah. Are there signs we can look for there there then to, that, that, that we would know? For most people, and again, I stress most people because nuance is important, the general advice that you usually get around the microbiota about, you know, we should eat more fibre, for example, is probably good advice. Um, we know that when we consume fiber, most of that will basically escape digestion by our own body in the small intestine. We, we lack the enzymes to break those fibers down and use them ourselves. So they pass into the colon where they become readily broken down and used by all of the microbes that live in there. So if we don't eat fiber, then these microbes essentially don't get fed <laughs> with the sort of you know, nutrients that they have evolved to, to grow and, and, and feed on. And so for most people, the general advice, eat lots of different fiber types, you know, feed these gut microbes and in return, take the benefits from those microbes is generally pretty good advice overall. Now, some people can't tolerate fiber, you know, and so, you know, for those people, you know, they get very bad GI symptoms, you know, they might get bloating, they might get diarrhea. And so for those cases, you know, actually the advice, eat more fiber may not be the best <laughs> advice for them. And well, so I think yes. microbiome, sorry, please. No, I was just going to say to sort of nuance that, um, if I ate a bowl of all bran, I might not have the best response. Yeah. But if I'm eating fibre from vegetables and a bit of salad and, you know, a bit of fruit, then I have a much better response. So are you saying really we should be focused on the plant-based fibres rather than some of those more, you know, you could say, a little bit more synthetic when something is created as a fiber product. I think, I think not necessarily. I think, I mean, we may touch on this a bit later on as well. I think, you know, some of these fibers, you know, these more processed ones, act, they still reach the colon intact and actually still act as a substrate for these microbes to grow on. And as a result of that, they may produce a range of beneficial substrates. I mean, the one that you may have heard talked about before is short chain fatty acids. These are, these are the end point breakdown products of bacteria in the gut. They break down the fiber, they release these acids and our body absorbs those. And there are now, you know, 
multiple studies across you know years and years and years showing that these acids have a range of beneficial effects on the body you know they're anti-inflammatory they're anti-carcinogenic uh, they may be linked to things like satiety responses some of them inhibit the growth of um, pathogenic nasty bugs so there's a whole range of benefits and so eating these more processed you know um, you know fibery type of things you've talked about that will still boost things like short chain fatty acid production in the gut and so i think i think what really this, this this means to me is that the microbiota becomes quite an essential component of the sort of burgeoning field of personalized nutrition. You know, this this thought that we can all have the same diet, but we will all respond in different ways based on our genetics, based on how our body processes that food. The microbiota is another factor that plays into that. So I think moving forwards, there, there, there is a push to try and you know optimize diets for individual people. Um, you know, I think there are major barriers to that, not least, of course, that to do that, one, you have to be able to profile someone's microbiota quickly and cheaply and understand what all those bugs actually do. And actually, at this point in time, the vast majority of microbes that live in the gut, we really don't know what they do. Uh, we don't know the long term effects of these bugs. And quite a lot of it is context dependent anyway, depending on what other bugs they're interacting with at the same time. It's that whole collection that everyone has. And that's unique as well. So so I think, you know, I think this stuff has problems like I talked about before, but um, getting towards, you know, a precision diet that suits you, that will take a bit of time, I think. There are companies doing that now around the world and trying to help people out with that. And as I say, I think it does have promise, but there's still a bit of research to be done in that area. That does make sense. And so I guess what you're saying is um, when it comes to fibre, follow our gut. And in general, we want to eat uh, more, we want to get more fibre in our diet, Um um, but we do that in a way that is most agreeable to our own digestive system. I think, I think that is that is usually what I say to people. You know, I mean, I think so. I've been studying um, gut microbiota for well over twenty years now, and the only thing I do differently, the only thing I take that is different to before I started, is I eat more fibre. Um, I don't take any probiotics and anything else. Um, and like I say. You, you, you kind of have to find your what agrees with you and what doesn't agree with you. Um, and, you know, um, I'm quite fortunate that, that there aren't fibres that really disagree with me. I can I can eat really whatever fibre I want. But for you, if you find that, you know, it does make you sick, you don't enjoy it, then, yeah, it makes absolute sense to strip that out of your diet. But the general advice overall, for reasons we may come on to later, is if you can support your microbiota by feeding them that fibre, for most people, that would generally be a good thing. I've spoken to nutritionists before on the channel who have talked about the need to eat a diet that's based on whole foods, and that includes a really diverse range of plant foods for gut health. So, you know, they're talking about trying to eat every colour of the rainbow and packing in a lot of different types of plants, vegetables and so on every week. I mean, is that something that you recognise? You know, what, what, if so, what does that diversity actually do for our, our gut? It's really important. That's a good point to make is, you know, that fibre captures actually quite a broad range of different products. It can be, as you say, vegetables, fruits, a range of different fruits. It can be, you know, uh, pulses, beans, things like that. You know, fibre covers a really broad range of types of fibre. Um, and, and the important point from a microbiota point of view is, is that different microbes will break down different fibres. So they have evolved the enzymes that allow them to break those down. And so, you know, you, you know like I say, if you just stick to having one type of fiber, then you might promote a subgroup of those microbes, but all the other ones that are, you know, evolved to break down different types of dietary fibers, they're not getting the benefit from that, right? So I think the conceptual sort of advice of having lots of different types of fiber, what that does is it covers a lot of bases. You're giving all these different types of bugs, um, uh, you know, something they can exploit. And therefore, in theory, you're promoting a broad diversity of microbes by allowing them these environmental conditions that allow them all to grow. So that's the theory behind it. You can argue about how useful diversity is in and amongst itself. You know, diversity of your gut microbiota does seem to correlate with health versus disease. Across a range of diseases, diversity tends to be lower. Um, but, um, you know, pinpointing down to if you're missing this much diversity, that means you definitely must be ill. Um, we haven't ever reached that point in the microbiome field, really. Yeah, so we don't, we can't pinpoint how much diversity we really should be getting into our diet and whether that is the the thing that's going to make the difference or whether just eating a diet that is just rich in natural fibres, take your pick of the things you like, 
Um, you know, is there going to be a massive difference between that and somebody who goes out of their way to literally count the number of different vegetables they can get into their shopping basket? I mean, I, mean, I think, I mean, it's not worth just about the microbiome, right? You know, with, with, if you're eating lots of fibres, there are other health benefits too. You know, you're, you're improving your transit time, so reducing risks of things like colorectal cancer over time. You know, there, you know lots of fibre is a benefit for cardiovascular health, for example. So I think the nice thing about this sort of learning more about the microbiota in this space is that it just adds an extra layer of evidence to existing sort of dietary guidelines around fibre that fibre generally for most people is good and the microbiota really is just another mechanistic explanation that underpins that benefit. There's a little bit more of a controversial theory that ties into this and it, it tends to come from what is a growing carnivore movement yeah. where they're saying you know when you're only eating animal products that you know we, we don't need this diverse range of gut bacteria created by a diverse diet where you know we're we're eating lots of different plants because they're saying the only reason that eating a wide range of plants creates that diversity in the gut is because it takes a lot of different bacteria to break them all down um so they're kind of arguing that there's no evidence that that diversity in itself is beneficial for our wider health and that's why they just stick with the animal products. Yeah. Is there an argument to be had there around that? Human beings are omnivores, right? You know, you know, you go up and look at the Inuit communities ancestrally up in the north. They're not eating much fresh vegetables there, right? They're living off of, you know, animal meat. You know, human beings can survive on animal meat. Um, no, that's that's not something you can deny. Um, I think, you know, I have an interesting anecdote about this. I, I gave a talk at Aberdeen Central Library a few years ago uh, on the sort of things we've talked about already today. And at the end of the talk, I had, I had a gentleman come up to me and say, ah, oh, that was nonsense about fibre. I'm a carnivore. I feel great ever since I've switched to a carnivore diet. I feel amazing. And then literally the next person I spoke to was a lady and she was like, oh, I loved your talk. I'm a vegan. And since I switched to a vegan diet, I feel great. And I said, well, you two should talk to each other, right? You know, because you two, you two are fundamentally disagreeing. And, and to me, the take home is, you know, human beings are omnivores, right? And a lot of that feeling great is probably a lot of a sort of placebo effect that comes from just from your own mind, really, to be honest, rather than a health benefit. Now, to touch upon your, your point about carnivore diets in particular. I think, look, as I said, people can survive on a carnivore diet quite well. Um, from a microbiome point of view, it is undeniable that is not a good idea. Okay. And so, as I said, the reason for that is that these fibers we consume, they feed the microbiota, right? And if you don't provide the microbiota with fiber, these microbes need other energy sources instead to live. Uh, and unfortunately, those other energy sources tend to be either us. <laughs> so um, in our gut, we have a mucus layer that protects um, our gut lining from the, the, the sort of microbes that live in the gut. And if we're not feeding them fibers, they start breaking down that mucus layer instead. They can grow on that. And if they eat the mucus layer, um, that can actually open up the barrier a little and allow microbes in to penetrate. And so there is some reasonable data now to suggest that, you know, low fiber diets increase risk of things like IBD and things like that because the, the barrier is being broken down by the microbes chomping away on the mucus instead of chomping away on fiber. The other thing they chomp away on is proteins. And so in contrast to fiber breakdown, I talked to you about these short chain fatty acids that are released from breaking down fiber. A lot of the fermentation products microbes make from protein are not thought to be as beneficial. Things like amines, indoles, um, you know, things that actually are linked to things like colorectal cancer development. So actually, if you don't feed the microbes the fiber that they need, they will break down other things and what they produce from those are potentially deleterious to health. Um, and so, I mean, the, the link between fiber consumption and protection of colorectal cancer is very clear. And I, my own uh, thoughts on that are that at least part of that is mediated by the microbiome releasing these beneficial. I, I told you things, they're, they're anti-carcinogenic, some of these, they, they can re reduce um, cancer cells forming. So I think, you know, if you go for a full carnivore diet, stripping out fiber, um, I think that you are increasing your risk long term of developing things like colorectal cancer. Now, I don't mean you're definitely going to get it. It's important to make that point. You know, we all know people that have smoked 60 cigarettes a day and they don't get lung cancer. But by smoking 60 cigarettes a day, what they're doing is increasing their risk of developing that sort of disease. And to me, if you go for an all carnivore, no fiber diet, you are likely increasing your risk of eventually developing gut problems. What's the latest evidence uh, about the, the link between the microbiome and obesity? 
Yeah, so, I mean, I think most of that's overblown, if I'm being honest. Um, it is absolutely true that we do gain some calories from our gut microbes. So when we eat things like fibre, I told you that these acids are released by the gut microbiota. So we actually absorb those acids and some of the cells that line your colon, they use those for energy. So your colon gets about 70% of its energy, those cells that line the colon, from one of these acids called butyrate. So you're getting some energy back from consuming this fiber um, that comes back to the host. But we're talking a vanishingly small amount of calories, a smallish amount of calories, you know, maybe 5% of calories per day in a sort of westernized diet type of setting that's relatively low in fiber. And so if you think about it, you know, Certainly, my microbiome might be better at extracting energy from fiber than yours, for example. And where if I, so I, on a daily basis, I might get a little bit extra energy via my microbiome, a few more calories, and that might therefore play into weight. But I, we're talking tens of calories here, a tiny amount. And so people say, yeah, but that can add up over a lifetime, an extra 10 calories every day, you know, that adds up and adds up and, and you can gain weight that way. That's not how human physiology works. The bigger you get, the more energy you need to sustain that weight. So obviously you, you, you will get to a point where, you know, you might put on a little bit of weight, but then your body burns more calories to sustain that weight. So you plateau. OK, so you don't get this ever increasing weight gain because of your microbes. So, like I say, the, the effect size of that is, is tiny in comparison to something like eating a chocolate bar instead. Right. You more than instantly uh, by eating that chocolate bar dwarf any calorific gain you get from having a more calorific microbiota than not. So to me, the you know the, the whole claim about microbiome and obesity, it's overplayed. Most of it comes from work done in rodent models. And actually there's very little you know, solid evidence from human studies to suggest that the microbiota is having huge impact on weight gain. You know, people have done fecal transplants between people who are um, lean, giving it to obese uh, patients, and they do not lose weight um, despite replacing the microbiota. They get some other interesting things like, you know, effects on insulin sensitivity potentially, but not on weight per se. So I think, you know, um, if you want to lose weight, then targeting the microbiota is not the most efficient way of doing that. There are better ways, more proven ways to lose weight. Where I had seen the coverage was around linking a flourishing gut microbiome with feeling more satiated after a meal. So almost having a similar effect to the likes of Ozempic and so on that we're hearing about. Um, it, has that got a weight to it, do you think? So again, that's mostly coming from rodent model work that's shown that you know, some of these short chain fatty acids that we'd already discussed, that they can actually trigger satiety responses. And that's thought to be one of the reasons why fiber with that slow release, um, you know, that, that might be one of the reasons why it has that satiety effect. Um, again, in human studies, the effect so far has not been anywhere near as dramatic as been seen in the rodent models. Um, so, like I say, it's one potential mechanism whereby a microbiota might play a role. But again, if we're talking about, you know, effect size, the effect size is, is likely much smaller than other ways, such as the azempic type drugs that you talked about. Um, you know, we can get into a debate about the pharmacology and, the, and, you know, the side effects and stuff. But undeniably, if you want to lose weight, they work much better than trying to tweak your microbiota. Yes. Yeah. And I mean, that is a whole whole separate debate, but that's an interesting one. Um I, so you, what you're kind of saying is it's more the benefits of, you know, where we eat fibre, we digest our food more slowly, those kind of benefits, we're, um, presumably the more fibre and uh, plant-based foods, whole foods and so on that we're eating, ideally we're starting to strip away the processed stuff if we're trying to look at a healthier diet and that in itself then starts to have the impact on weight. Yeah, no, I mean, fibre itself has a bulking effect, right? You know, because it's not broken down easily, you know, it, make, it fills the stomach and, you know, at least things, it makes you, if you stretch the receptors, it makes you feel that you're kind of fuller, you know? So it's not just, again, about microbe interactions. Fibre in and itself has lots of other impacts on, on the human body. Okay, uh, interesting. So linked to that then, what do we know about what eating a lot of processed foods mm. does to your gut? So, yeah, I mean, that, that is a very hot topic <clears throat> across, um, you know, across the world, actually, now, because as obviously, you know, the world is urbanizing, more and more people in a global context are starting to eat a lot of processed foods. You know, <clears throat> allied to that, we're seeing a rise in sort of autoimmune conditions, you know, you know 
things were plausibly altering the microbiota might have a role. So it, it's a huge area of research at the moment. I think there are some clear um, significant losses from a highly processed diet, and one of those is the fibre. One of the main casualties of processing food is that the fibre stuff tends to get stripped out and you're left with more easily digestible. So straight away you're losing a lot of that fibre that is traditionally feeding the gut microbiota. The second, I think that's probably uncontroversial to say that. I think the, the stripping out the fibre is probably not a good thing from having a highly processed diet. I think what is slightly gets into more controversial cutting edge is the effect of some of the more chemical components of those. Um, there's certainly evidence from mouse work to suggest that things like sweeteners and, and emulsifiers and, and things like that you know, might have an impact on the microbiota. But again, I stress at this point in time, most of that comes from rodent models and we lack really good data from human studies yet um, to show that they're having similar effects in us. Um, and so I think that the jury is out a little bit to some extent on some of these more chemical components. Yeah, because there's been some quite a lot of noise just very recently um, about claims from scientists that emulsifiers have been mm. shown to break down the protective layer yeah. of mucus that you mentioned that lines the gut, allowing more harmful bacteria to get in and then actually linking that mm -hmm. with the equally uh, well publicized rise in cancer cases yeah. under 50. I mean, I can touch on that directly because we have actually done a study on emulsifiers. Um, I think, again, a bit like fibre, a really important nuance that you have to bring in here is that emulsifiers actually covers a whole range of different compounds. There are very different types of uh, molecule and they have different types of effects. Okay, So emulsifier isn't just one thing. It's a range of different chemicals. Um, and I can't talk too much about it because we haven't written it up yet. It's not peer reviewed, but I can give you a very general um, take home message, which is that the one emulsifier we tested which tends to be a more natural one, had zero impact on the gut microbiota at all. And we fed people lots of it. it and you can't change. tell us which one it I is. Can't tell, I can't because I'm really sorry. But it had, that one had zero impact on the, the microbiota. We, we, As you said, it's thought that, it, that some of these can break down the barrier a little bit and allow microbes to get across into your bloodstream. We checked the blood of the people who consumed it and there was no difference in the number of microbes in their blood either. So this particular emulsifier, at least under our controlled human trial conditions, had zero impact on um, on the microbiota of humans. And when will that be published? Because we'll uh, have when, to when I write the open. paper. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> that, that takes time, unfortunately. Now, I will say that, you know, in mouse models, the, the emulsifier we tested also similarly seems to be quite benign and other types seem to be a bit more damaging to the gut. So I think I think that that becomes important because obviously if you're in the food industry, you can pick and choose which emulsifiers you add to your food. And so potentially if you're adding these less harmful ones compared to the more harmful ones, actually that makes the processed food less damaging than it might be otherwise. And so I do think that's why we need these good quality human studies because that can inform both what we eat as consumers but also how the dietary um, industry, the diet industry prepares their food, you know. So, um, so yeah, there's a lot of research in this space and it's not just emulsifiers, again, like th things like sweeteners, similar studies are being done. And hopefully what that will do over the next decade or so is allow food producers to make informed decisions about what sort of things we're adding to processed foods and hopefully therefore be less damaging in theory. So uh, where we're seeing... Um warning messaging from, you know, scientists and doctors and so on. It's, we hear it multiple times on different podcasts. I listen to a lot of them where they're warning about sweeteners, artificial sweeteners in drinks, that kind of thing. Are you saying the jury is actually still out on that? I am actually, yeah, for most of that, yeah. Yeah, I think I think because, you know, I think theoretically all these points are well made. And again, there are warning signs from animal model studies. So again, there's no... I'm not saying making these warnings is not appropriate because it's, it's, I think it's fine to have that debate. I think what you also have to balance that is, though, that, you know, if people are not having sweeteners, then potentially they're having the sugar. And so then the weight gain that comes from that, the health problems that come from that also has to be balanced against the, the detrimental effects or theoretical detrimental effects of these sweeteners. So I guess what I'm saying is, as, as I hark back to the start of this interview, is it's really complicated you know, it's very hard to distill dietary interventions down to one effect and say that's good, that's bad. I said there's always a, a trade-off and where you might have one benefit, like you might lose weight and therefore get all the health benefits from that. 
potentially these might have a different detrimental effect. And, and finding that balance is, is difficult. And finding that balance when you advise the public is also very difficult, especially because, as I say, the data really aren't in yet for most of these um, you know, things from human studies. Yeah, I guess you could say if you want to manage your risk profile, then not having a lot of these things yeah. at least cuts out any theoret theoretical risk or just having these things as treats or whatever, you know, um, would probably be the more sensible approach. I mean, I, 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 that, that's absolutely fair. I will, I will add that there is a slight sort of... Um, I guess privilege in that in that in that standpoint because you know you know if you are someone with a low income for example and um, you're, you're attending a food bank or something you take what you can get and quite a lot often these processed foods are cheaper than you know the healthier whole food alternatives so so for you and I to make that point about yes in theory you should avoid them that is a privileged position to take you know we are we are lucky we can afford to do so and sometimes actually just getting nutrition is the lesser of two evils, you know. So, I mean, it, it's difficult, right? You know, as, as with all of these nutritional things, very little is, you know, black and white set in stone. Are there any chemicals that you are aware of that we know to be harmful to the gut microbiome? Um, and I'm even, I'm even thinking in terms of medications, things like that. Is there anything that we know absolutely this is harmful? Yeah. So again, a very burgeoning field of research all around the world. Lots of lots of chemicals are being investigated for that effect. I mean, the obvious one is antibiotics. They will absolutely decimate your microbiota, I think. But again, nuance is so important, and I and I cannot get this across. Antibiotics absolutely save lives. You know, if you if you go through a churchyard from a hundred years ago, look how many infants are in that churchyard graveyard. Um, people died in their droves from infectious diseases years ago. Antibiotics have saved countless lives. Okay, and so again, you have to balance that. You know, um, you know, um, I tend, um, you know, to only have antibiotics if I really need to. You know, I don't disappear down to the doctor if I've got a bit of sniffle or something because there is a collateral damage that comes from taking an antibiotic because it will not only kill the pathogen, it will kill um, some of the beneficial microbes too. Now, the good news from that is that actually, unless you repeatedly hit your body with antibiotics over and over and over again, it seems like the microbiota is relatively resilient and most of those microbes will come back eventually, usually within a couple of weeks in most cases. Um, so it's maybe not, um, you know, you know, something to worry about if it's a short term, you know, and again, like I say, if it's going to save your life, it's absolutely worth taking the antibiotic. Um, other drugs beyond that, I mean, like I say, there, there's now huge data sets coming in now that all sorts of drugs no, no, whatever you can think of has some impact on the microbiota. I think a bit like dietary interventions, the effect it has is unfortunately going to be individual specific because it depends what microbes you have in your gut in the first place. If drug X kills bug Y, but you never had bug Y in your gut anyway, who cares? Right? You know, it's not, it's not a problem. If you have bug Y, then maybe it is a problem for you. And so again, that, that personalized response to medications is something that is of interest, you know, yeah, to researchers around the world at the moment too, but very, very difficult to disentangle. Um, well, how about alcohol? Because, yeah. uh, you know, I've had people make the point that uh, we use alcohol and hand sanitizer to kill bacteria. So what do we expect it to do in our gut? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a good question. I think I think I always come back to dose, you know, <laughs> how much alcohol are we talking? So if you put alcohol hand rub on your skin, you're hitting the microbes with a huge, very concentrated dose of alcohol. When you drink alcohol, you know, if it's a beer, it's 5% content or whatever of the, of the drink. Most of that gets absorbed into your bloodstream in the, in the small intestine. So very little of that is going to reach your colon and then have an impact on your, your gut microbiota there. It's a small, tiny amount, right? Um, so again, is that amount likely to be damaging? I, I know for a fact that, you know, because we, we've done studies with, uh, with problem drinkers, people who have really been long-term um, problem drinkers. And they had, I have to say, very, very, very messed up microbiotas are really you know, heavily damaged microbiotas. But these are people who are really dependent on the alcohol, probably not eating a very good diet either, have lifestyle issues as well. And so I think for the average person consuming a, you know, a glass or two here or there, I, I would suspect that it's probably not majorly damaging to the gut because the dose that reaches the gut is pretty small. It's also worth mentioning quite a lot of the microbes in your gut actually make ethanol themselves as an end product. So they release ethanol into your gut all the time. And actually, there's some thoughts that some people that have a lot of these ethanol producers that might actually be endangering their liver health because that eventually is getting put into the bloodstream and transferring to the liver. So um, it's an interesting area that, again, it's just right on the cusp of research at the moment. Yeah. And a bit like everything else, I guess it's 
it's really about watching the excess on yeah. alcohol uh, because there are, as you say, possibilities there. There are a huge number of products out there that uh, purport to improve gut health. So, you know, we know about supplements and there's green powders. Um, I have to confess that I did recently buy, I, I actually just threw the remainder out today because I concluded it was upsetting my gut rather than anything else. But I did buy a bottle of um, humic extract that was said to be derived from ancient soil. I don't know where that ancient soil is. So, you know, I mean, when I, when families started to question, why, where is this source from? Why are you drinking this? I was kind of like, well, I listened to somebody on a podcast and, you know, they were basically saying it contained the trace minerals and amino acids that our guts need, but are destroyed by pesticides. You know, that's a whole other area, pesticides. I mean, do you think there is a case for replenishing, considering modern day pesticides, and we're told that they strip key nutrients and, you know, um, trace minerals and so on out of our food? Is, is there a case for taking probiotics or something like this? With most of these products, they're, right, if, you, if, you, if you reel it all the way back to the conception of it, there is a kernel of truth in there, which then suddenly gets over extrapolated to actually become meaningless. And so, you know, I think I touched on this when we first started speaking. You know, we've reached this point where there's a vacuum in the in the microbiome field from the public's point of view. People know it's important. People know it can have an effect on their health. But actually, there's nothing really available that you can take that really has the weight of scientific evidence behind it to show that it really works. There are a very limited number of products. So that vacuum has been filled with all sorts of products, as you've just described, or, you know, of various types claim to have these effects, but actually if you drill down into the data, the evidence they have to support that, the vast, vast majority do not actually have proper evidence that they work. Um, so I, I think my advice to consumers is always buyer beware. No, no, really look to see, have they got the proof? Did they do studies in big controlled human studies that proved that their product actually had a benefit? And you'll actually find that for the vast majority, unfortunately, at this point in time, um, that evidence isn't there. Now, that's not to say it won't eventually come, but at this point in time, the vast majority of products you can buy online lack that support that shows that they definitively work. Are you a believer in the kefirs and the, um, the other types of naturally um, probiotic-rich food? The best answer to that, as I told you, the only thing I do differently since studying microbiota is eat more fibre. <laughs> and that's it. I, I don't drink kefir. I don't take probiotics. Um, yeah. Again, I mean, I should, I should, I should add that probably these things are, in most cases, aren't doing any harm. Um, but you know, I would argue that the evidence for their, for their, for actually having a beneficial effect, quite often, is just not there at this point in time. We hear about the microbiome in terms of the gut, brain, and even skin access. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What is known about how the gut microbiome influences our wider health? our brain health, the health of our skin, how wide reaching? Does it influence absolutely every element of our being, do you think, the gut microbiome? Absolutely every element is probably not true, but I think it's probably close to most, I would say. Um, you know, I'm pretty sure microbiota didn't make me go bald. Um, but, you, know, you never know. Um, <laughs> I, I, yeah. But I think, you know, it, it certainly, you know, what happens in our gut doesn't necessarily stay in our gut. You know, um, a lot of the molecules that the microbes squeeze, they can be absorbed into the bloodstream and then they can go systemic. Um, certainly, you know, again, we talk about things like fiber consumption, these short chain fatty acids, those, those do go systemic and they are thought to sort of dampen down immune responses that are overactive in the lungs, for example. So certainly, you know, what happens in our gut doesn't have to stay there. You can have systemic effects on the rest of the body. Um, the gut brain axis, like you talked about, that, that again is another huge area of hotspot research at the moment. Um, you know, if you think about it logically, <clears throat> we all evolved from single tube animals where our only contact with the environment was through our gut. OK, um, and so you no, know, that was how we would sense the environment, change our biology and respond to it. And so there's there are definite links between our brains and our guts. And that's been known about for centuries. You know, <clears throat> one of the... <clears throat> The cures that have one of the better rates for things like IBS 
it's hypnotherapy and cognitive behavioral therapy where you just try and chill people down a bit, you know. And so there are undeniable links between the brain and the gut. Going in both directions, it yeah. sounds like. Yep, yeah, yeah, you know, well, how, well, the brain obviously will impact the physiology of the gut. So, you know, the release of hormones and things like that and how our gut can respond to food. Um, in return, there's some evidence that the microbiota makes analogues of some signaling compounds like serotonins and GABA, things like that. Again, I caution that a lot of this work is done in mouse studies and is not yet progressed into finding a definitive proof in humans. And certainly most of the evidence for thinking things like probiotics for depression and things like that has not come up with a consistent sort of this definitely works sort of story. The results have been a lot less impressive than in mice. So again, it's a kind of watch these space sort of um, story whereby this stuff might eventually become more to the mainstream. But at this point in time, we're really still in the discovery phase, I would suggest. How about age and how it impacts the gut microbiome? Because we hear a lot about basically our cells kind of, you know, becoming less productive as we age. Um, what happens in our gut? Yeah, so so there are there so there's lots of evidence that as we age, you know, the microbiome will start to slightly change too. I think what's not clear is 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 the is the role of aging in that in itself or how we change. So you know, as you get older, you know, you 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 might have gut problems, you get diverticulitis, things that like you can't have as much fiber. You know, you might find the old cliched widower whose you know wife has died and used to make his dinner, and now he has to make his own dinner, and he has tea and toast so he's not so he's not, again is it diet that's infecting that you get teeth problems dentition problems your immune system starts to slow down a bit and so how you control the microbes all of these factors are probably at play i will say that you know um again how it varies seems to vary from person to person you know how it changes will depend on what's there in the first place to be changed but it certainly does seem to be the case that as we age, our microbes in our gut also evolve and change a little bit too. And sometimes in ways that if you, just at face level don't seem to be too beneficial. You, you tend to find, as, a, as an average, <clears throat> some of the more pro-inflammatory, less beneficial microbes become a bit more established. Not dominant, but a bit more established. So I think, um, again, another area of hot topic research but the, 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 the percentage role that the microbiota is playing in the microbiota aging and the body's aging process, sorry, I, I'm not sure we have a, a handle on that at this point in time. My own feeling is that as we age, our diet becomes more and more important because it's, it's the one thing that we can control or it's one of the things that we can control um, along with exercise and stress and sleep and so on yeah. that might give us the best shot. And, you know, it's just, I suppose if we know that fibre plays an important role. You would want to make sure that as you age, this is what I'm concluding from what we're what we're we've discussed, that you want to make sure you've got a fibre rich diet. I mean, it's certainly true that the, the, the people who, who are starting to get to more elderly stages of life who are still consuming that diverse diet that we talked about, they tend to have more what you would associate with health type microbiomes in their gut. It's the ones who are, you know, in long-term healthcare type situations, you know, th those are the ones where the microbiome starts to go a little bit off down that trajectory. Maybe we wouldn't like to see. So, so I agree, you know, things that you can do to look after yourself, exercise, diet, you know, it, it's not a bad idea. Finally, what are some of the most exciting pieces of research going on right now around uh, gut bacteria and the role they play in our health. What 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 are some of the ones to watch? Definitely your emulsifier one. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. No, I think I think I think that is one area how these individual food components may impact on health. That's coming. As I said, the human studies are coming. I think for me, my, my favourite little babies that I'm interested in are the are the are the anaerobic microbes that live in the gut. Now, just to explain very briefly what those are. Um, <clears throat> most of the microbes that live in our gut are when you expose them to air they're dead okay there's not much oxygen inside your gut and so 99 percent of the microbes that live in there are very strict anaerobes and when you put them in the oxygen they, they die okay now when you ask people what what name me a gut microbe most people will instinctively say someone like e coli or they will say lactobacillus or you know, a probiotic type bug now these are less than one percent your microbiota less than 0.1 percent in the case of lactobacillus these are tiny components of our microbes so the things that i'm interested in are these dominant anaerobes that make up 99 percent and actually we know comparatively much less about what they do and i think the untapped potential in there because as i say these are the dominant microbes that are having all these beneficial effects on our health if we can somehow work out who's doing what 
and harness those as novel sort of next generation probiotics, whereby, you know, instead of giving a bug like a lactobacillus that ends up surrounded 100,000 to one by all these other bugs, it's completely outnumbered with one of the dominant ones. That, to me, has a greater chance of exerting a beneficial effect on the body. So for me, um, it's that disentangling of all this complex microbiota, all these different species, and trying to work out which might be the key players and how we might get those into people as sort of truly beneficial microbes with a weight of evidence behind them to suggest that they really will work. So for me, that's the place. Now, that, that'll take time. I, I'm talking 20 years. I'm not talking five years, unfortunately. And those anaerobes, I mean, are we talking about a tremendous number of, of different ones <laughs> that are going to have to be picked out and extracted? Yeah, no, thousands of species. Yeah, thousands of species that you have to try and work out. So I, I, like I say, it's, you're looking at a galaxy of stars and trying to work out which is the most interesting, exciting star. It's a really difficult. I mean, I think I said right at the start, I wish the public would, would be able to just be told more often that it's really, really complex. It's a whole ecosystem you know, living inside you as a human being. Billions of bacteria all interacting together with you and with each other. And that somehow comes up with these effects on us as hosts. It's really complicated. Yeah, and I suppose when we're rushing to one conclusion about one particular thing, we are missing out a lot of context and interactions and um, things that are as yet unseen, if that makes any sense. You know? No, it does. I mean, it does. I mean, I think I have to say that, you know, the complexity is so much that it's it, the human brain can't comprehend it, frankly. So you have to reduce that down to simple messages. As I said at the start, though, quite often the simple messages very rarely are true in all cases. And that's the problem with the microbiota. Nuance is so important. I, I generally, I, I know, as a scientist, I, I, I do appreciate the frustrations because I want to know too. I think it's just science is difficult. It's hard. It takes a long time. And, you know, I think what you read in the newspapers, you know, and again, I don't blame journalists for this at all. They work on very different time frames. They've got to report the next day. And people <laughs> want to know. They just yeah, want exactly. simple messages. Do this. Don't do that. This is bad. This is good. And yeah. people get very frustrated if you cannot pin, pin that down. So they will move towards experts and scientists who will go to a little more of an extreme and be willing to say, yes, you can't do that. That's going to that's gonna take you out, you know, so cut that out. Um, and I guess that's what your message is up against, actually. And it's just sometimes helpful to be reminded, you know what, the evidence isn't quite there yet. We've got some way to go on this. Professor Walker, it's been great to have you and uh, get your perspective. It's been a great to have you. Thanks very much for inviting me on. If you enjoyed this interview, check out the description below where I've linked to other educational conversations like this one around diet and the microbiome. And you can now listen to The Honest Channel on the go on YouTube Music, Apple Podcasts and Spotify. You'll find them all linked below. You'll also find more information and advice from me on how to look and feel good for longer on my website, honest.scott. And you'll find below a page where you can sign up for my monthly newsletter rounding up all my latest content so you don't miss a thing. But for now, thanks for being here today.